<laughs> I want you to have a think about this question. If you went to the doctor, and let's say you were uh, 65 years old, maybe with mild blood pressure, and the doctor or the nurse does your pulse palpation, and it's abnormal, how likely <coughs> is it that you've actually got atrial fibrillation? What's the, what's the chance of that? Based on these numbers that you're given of sensitivity and specificity, does anyone want to have a stab what they think? Is it 90%? Is it 1%? How, where is it? How, how worried should you be? 30, 30%. 90%. 90%. Yeah. 30, 30. Wow. So this is it. You've got a really big spectrum. You said, did you say 5? Yeah. But it's normal. Yeah. And what is the chance you've got atrial fibrillation? 7%. 7%. Very specific. <laughs> Explain your calculation. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you've done. Okay. So this is quite difficult, isn't it? You go to the doctor, you have your pulse felt, they tell you it's abnormal. <coughs> oh my goodness, I've got atrial fibrillation. How likely is it? The answer is it's actually not very likely. And let's look at why. Now, assuming there's a prevalence in a that group it's a 65 year old person with hypertension of about 3%. That means three people in every hundred that you screen will have the disease and have the condition. And this is what's called a two by two table. And let's still run through it. So there will be people who've got AF. Here they are. And there will be people who have not got AF. Here they are. And then you apply a test to them. You do your pulse palpation. And you say, oh, it's abnormal. True positive. So the patient's got AF, and your pulse palpation is abnormal. They go in that box, the true positive. And based on this um, type of uh, scenario, you'll remember 3% <coughs> of 1,000 is 30 people. <coughs> your test function is about 93% sensitivity. So it'll pick up 28 people, your, your pulse palpation, out of the 1,000. It'll say it's abnormal, and they'll have atrial fibrillation. It will miss two people because it's not a perfect test. Okay, everyone with me so far? Yeah. What about the people who don't have the condition? Okay, that's to do with the specificity of the test. You remember it was about seventy-five percent. That means it only gets it right three quarters of the time. Now, as you can see, the majority of people out of the thousand don't have the condition, do they? Nine hundred and seventy people do not have AF, but because the test only works correctly 75% of the time. It picks up lots and lots of people where it says they're abnormal, but they don't actually have the condition at all. So it's got a very high false positive rate, this test, this pulse by patient. And then the, the group down here where it gets it right. So the problem with, with all these tests is you feel the pulse, if it's abnormal, there's a relatively low chance, about 1 in 10, actually it's 9%, you'll see on the next slide. There's only a 9% chance that actually you were truly abnormal. If the test was completely normal, absolutely fine when you felt the pulse, there's a 99.7% chance that it's correct and you're okay. So this actually is quite good, in a sense, because if the thing you're trying to find is very dangerous and important to find, you want to have a very high negative predictive value. In other words, if your test tells you it's all fine, it is all fine. So we use this in medicine where we are trying to rule out conditions. So what the pulse palpation does, it allows you quite simply and easily to rule out atrial fibrillation. But when the test is abnormal, it doesn't rule it in very lightly. You have to go on and do a further test, like an ECG. And we use the same thing, for example, when we're trying to detect heart failure. The patient comes to the doctor with breathlessness. The doctor measures something called BNP. It's a blood test. If the test is normal, the patient has not got heart failure. If the test is abnormal, they might have heart failure, but usually they haven't. So it's a rule-out test. So that's where your pulse palpation works, works really well. It's also very, very critically dependent, this, on how frequent the thing you're looking for occurs. Because if I said, look, three people <coughs> per thousand have got the condition, 9% chance of it being correct. If I push the number up 
to 15%, this goes way up to 37. So you see, the more prevalent the condition is in the population, the more, the better the test performs, essentially. You find more of the cases. And this applies to every test in medicine, whether it's PSA for the gentleman in the room, or mammography for the women in the room. There's one said that there's a guy called Gerd Gigerenzer. He gives a great talk. He's based in Berlin, and he's a statistician. And he's written a book called Risk Savvy. Okay? And his thesis is that we find it very difficult to interpret and understand risk. And he gives an example where he gives a lecture to a bunch of gynecologists. And he says, if a woman goes for a mammogram and the result is abnormal, how likely is it that she's got, the patient has got breast cancer? So, well, it's very likely. The mammograms have more. In fact, it's about 10%. Okay? Because of the same thing that you've seen here. You get lots and lots and lots and lots of false negatives. The same when you test for PSA in older men's blood, looking for prostate cancer, you end up finding a lot of false positives and doing a lot of biopsies and all sorts of other things. So it's important to remember this when we're thinking about any of these tests. So the pulse check is really good. Would you like a glass of water? Cool. You've got one. Okay. It's a really good test because it picks the patients up, but it does mean that if you get an abnormal result, you are likely to go off and have an ECG, and it may well be that you were absolutely fine. What it also is important to note is you really need that ECG there and then when you have that pulse check. Because it's no good going to the doctor, oh, with the age, with your pulse is irregular, you better go to Epsom Hospital have an ECG next week. Because you might go there and it'd be normal, but it could be that you had paroxysmal AF and it was abnormal when you were at the pup doctors and then it becomes normal again. So you need the ECG there and then to confirm the diagnosis. They did do a study where they took people <clears throat> attending for the flu vaccine and they wanted to see whether um, it, this was a good strategy. If you're coming for the flu vaccine, have a pulse check. And did it work? So this is a study of about nearly 600 people. 95 people had an irregular pulse. That's a pretty high number out of that group of 600. 21 of them had AF, so that's okay. We knew about them and we weren't going to detect anymore, and they took the rest and they invited them for an ECG. Now interestingly, out of nearly 70 people who were invited to go for an ECG, only just under 40, 39 people went, and only two cases of AF were diagnosed. <coughs> so the conclusion from this was that actually this wasn't a terribly good way to screen for AF, because in fact you screened an awful lot of people to find very few cases, and actually it cost... £234 for every case you found, so it was quite an expensive way of doing it. But part of the problem here is if they'd said to these folk at this point, go next door and have the ECG, I bet most of them would have gone and had it done. But because they said, here's a form, you know, go to the hospital, make an appointment, have the test, it didn't happen. People just said, probably said, oh, I can't, don't want to do that, or I don't see why I should, or I feel fine. And so the limitation was the very low uptake of ECG done there. So it does show that if you're going to do this type of thing, you need to make it really smooth and easy for the patient to just go and have the test done straight away and not put lots of barriers in their place. Now, we've got this device, which people have looked at as a way to screen for... Um, uh, atrial fibrillation, and we've used this ourselves down in the Ashley Centre. Um, you've, I think most people have most people seen this little device. It fits on the back of the phone. Um, it gives you a single lead ECG. It's very quick to do. You can screen 100 people in a morning, find a few cases. It works. It's got FDA um, Food and Drug Administration. Um, uh, approval for the detection of atrial fibrillation, and the FDA don't give that lightly. They do a lot of checks and a lot of tests, and it's very hard to get new technology into America, despite what you might think. Medical, they, they tend to want to have very strong evidence. So it's got a little device in it for AF detection. So for example, if uh, one, when we had our meeting with uh, Surrey at the CCG about arrhythmias recently, I said to them, I think every GP should have one of these. Every surgery should have one, and nearly every GP should have one. So if you are in the surgery, they can, rather than just 
checking your pulse, they could check your pulse and then do this. And it helps in terms of making a diagnosis because it's very good accuracy for detection. Now, they have compared, if we use the gold standard of a 12 lead ECG as, the, as had to diagnose there, it has been compared to the um, Alive Core device. And the sensitivity for picking it up is about 94%. So it's pretty good compared to a 12 lead ECG. And it picks up in diverse populations. And there's plenty of, of uh, evidence that this is a, a very good way to screen <laughs> for atrial fibrillation. And it's very cheap and cost effective. Now, of course, the patient could use that themselves at home. Could decide, well, I'm going to do my ECG every day, for example. Um, I'm going to check myself morning and evening. You could, if you're totally neurotic, you could do it every hour. You know, you could theoretically do that. It's completely free once you've got it to use and it stores the rhythm strips. The downside to these devices, of course, is they require some interpretation. The machine has a little algorithm in it and it'll say normal or AF, but sometimes it'll say indeterminate. It's only a machine, so it can't get it right all the time. And it's easy if a cardiologist or a, a medic is looking at it, but it's much harder for a patient. So for home use, this might have some limitations, but it's certainly a, a, a real step forward in terms of detection. Of course, you've got to buy the device. You've got to have a smartphone buy the device. And for some people, it may be, um, they may not wish to purchase a 160 pound uh, phone case for their phone. So there are other ways and one which I think is very interesting, it's not available yet, but it, it's certainly coming, is to make use of the technology within the phone to, to detect AF. Now, you've, you know that there's a camera on your phone, and it turns out that if you're clever, you can program the camera to pick up the pulses going through your fingers. If you put your finger over the, over the camera, the light's on, it will, these people have done it, de be able to de detect your pulse. And what they're doing in this is they're seeing whether the pulse is nice and regular. And then they put a load of maths in there, which basically says, is the, is the interval between the pulses beautifully stable, like that, or is it very irregular and all over the place, which is what will happen in atrial fibrillation. And if you do enough sampling and you put enough math in there, you can have a very, very high, according to this paper, accuracy at picking up atrial fibrillation. Now, you have to take this a little bit of a pinch of salt, because if people are having ectopic beats, and that is not uncommon, uh, then this may not perform as well. But it's certainly something to think about in the future. It might be that it's just an app that you download on your phone for you know, 90p, and you can just stick your finger over the, over the camera and it will give you an idea about whether you have atrial fibrillation or not. Again, probably not useful for medical practitioners, but maybe useful for patients. And certainly in somebody who had had AF diagnosed, maybe it's parasitical, and they wanted to keep an eye on themselves, this might be a neat way to do it. Now there's this little device, it's called My Diagnostic. Okay. And the idea behind this is for use in primary care. So lots of people go to the GP, they may not go because of a heart problem, but they're coming through the waiting room. And it may be possible to screen people while they're waiting for their appointment. They could, for example, um, hold, the idea is you hold on to this stick, and it, it's got some electronical gubbins inside, which works out whether your pulse is regular, or not regular. It works very similar to the Alive Core. It's recording an ECG. There is no display on it. It simply goes green, <coughs> amber, or red to, to tell you whether you've got green, normal rhythm, red is picking up atrial fibrillation, and amber <coughs> is not sure. And again, the companies that sell this tell you that they have a high sensitivity and high specificity. The specificity, in other words, how right the test is. When the test tells you you're abnormal, how accurate is it? is much better than a pulse check. It's coming up about 93%. So the good thing about this is you get lots less false negatives, lots of less people who are worried by something that they don't need to be worried about because they're all right. So this is coming, and you may see these devices. The other device is this thing called the Rhythm Pad. Here, 
It's kind of self-explanatory. You simply put your hands on it. These electrodes pick up the electrical activity traveling through your body, just like you do with the Alive Core type of device. And the idea is you'd have this in the GP surgery in the reception. You, when you check in, you put your hands on it, and it does a quick check to make sure you haven't got atrial fibrillation. <coughs> it produces a nice report, and we use this at the Ashley Centre as well. We found it missed a case that we picked up on the other device, the Alive Core. But it, it does function quite well. And if you look at the data from their um, uh, documentation that goes to the device, they'll say, look, atrial fibrillation is picking it up sort of 93% of the time, and it's accurate 99.8% of the time. It's pretty good. So these different devices, you can see they have their role perhaps in different situations. Some of them in a surgery, some of them in a hospital, some of them in your own home. About blood pressure monitors. We've many, many people who, who might be at risk of atrial fibrillation have got a blood pressure machine at home. Some of those blood pressure machines, it will flash up if there's an arrhythmia. Are they accurate? Are they good? When you measure your blood pressure with this type of device, this is just an example called a watch VP, it, it is assessing the pulses that are traveling through your arm. You probably might realize this, but when the cuff goes up and it extends, gradually goes down, there's a pressure wave <coughs> traveling through your arm that is caused by your heart beating. And of course, if it's nice and regular, the machine is picking up a regular pressure wave. If it's atrial fibrillation, it'll be very erratic. So the machine has the ability to pick that up. And there's a nice um, study with this, a lot of data in there, but again, suggesting that these types of devices are very sensitive and pretty specific at picking up atrial fibrillation. So they have a role as well. And if it's something that you're one's measuring at home with blood pressure regularly because you're on a blood pressure tablet, then this may be a, a good thing, nice thing to have. Of course, it doesn't mean you have AF if it's abnormal. As you can see here, the specificity is quite low sometimes. That means it'll tell you you're abnormal when maybe you're not. Yeah, so you have to be careful. It's very sensitive. Lots and lots of people. So if it tells you you're normal, you're normal. If it tells you you're abnormal, you might be normal, but you might be abnormal. It's, that's where the tests start to break down. Some people have looked to see, there's a bit nice little paper from Birmingham, where they looked to see what the best way to screen was. They compared the uh, blood pressure machine we just saw, single lead ECG by Omron, which I know some, some people have here, and a little thing called a Merlin. It's like a watch. It's, they're all the same type of devices. You just has an electrode at the bottom, electrode at the top. You put your hand on it. You get it gives an ECG signal. So they compared all of these different things, and they compared it with the nurse pulse palpation. And you can see here, actually, the nurse performed very well. 100% sensitivity. Everybody that had AF, the nurse picked up by the... Um, by the uh, procedure. Now maybe the nurse was about it prior information. So then they blinded the nurse to all background knowledge. <laughs> Down goes the sensitivity. So you see human factors play a role here. But you can see the different devices. In fact, the BP monitor was pretty good, 94%. Um, the Omron the ECG, the watch thing, they're all performing quite well. So these things are not unreasonable ways to, to be able to detect atrial fibrillation. But of course, they'll only detect it if it's there at the time you do the measurement. And the measurement's going to only be over a few seconds, isn't it? 10 seconds, 30 seconds. So if you've got the AF that's coming and going, you might miss it with this. So what about longer term detection? So this type of technology has been around for decades. The so-called 24-hour tape. It's no longer 24 hours, and there's no tape involved. But we still, you hear doctors calling it a 24-hour tape. It's just a natural, um, colloquial term. And they were originally, they were cassette tapes. And they're a very big thing, and the patient would wear it with the stickers. The stickers haven't got any smaller, but the machine has got a bit smaller. And of course, now they record digitally, and they can record for long periods of time. Uh, but they still rely on ECG electrodes being stuck to the skin, 
and then go into some with wires to a little box. <coughs> and the recording is made of every single heartbeat the patient has over a period of time. And that can be how long you want. But traditionally, it's been 24 hours. And then when you finish with it, you take it back to the hospital or wherever, and they stick it in a machine, and then they analyze it. It's actually very laborious analyzing this. Because as you know, there's 100,000 heartbeats every day. And somebody's got to look through 100,000 heartbeats worth of data. Now, the machines have got computers in them that try to pull out abnormalities. But sometimes if the trace is what we call noisy, there's lots of interference, someone's got to manually check everything. So it, it can be very, very time consuming and rather tedious for, for people to do. You can look at this. This is a plot on the uh, right here of the heart rate effectively against time. And you can see here, this is 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. Everything's fine. There's some blips, but that's okay. They're just, they're just noise or whatever. But something happened at 11 o'clock, you can see, because the heart rate went up suddenly. Now, it's unusual for your heart rate to go up at 11 o'clock at night and to stay up to 3 o'clock in the morning and then suddenly come back down again. Okay, so that's an episode of atrial fibrillation the patient had. So the heart rate went from about 60 beats a minute up to about 100 beats a minute. And it became very variable. What the three lines are, the variability between the, the pulses. So probably what's going on here, actually a little tiny bursts of AF, and then there's a long burst of AF. That's occurring at night time. Maybe that's vagal AF. It's a night time. It's possible. So if you put the monitor on and you see something like this, well, you've got the diagnosis, it's very straightforward, you've confirmed it, there's a long period of atrial fibrillation, you simply go back to the patient, you ask them if they have any symptoms, they may not have done, you assess their risk score and you might offer them anticoagulation based on the risk score, it's easy. But so much of the time, the 24 hour tape comes back showing no abnormalities at all. You can extend the, the, the monitoring up to seven days with these devices. The limiting factor is really not the device itself, but the, the acceptability of wearing ECG electrodes and wires under your clothes for a long period of time. It's uncomfortable. You kind of, you, you, know, you want to go and have a shower. You, you, can you take them off? Can't you take them off? You can, but you stick them back on again. Or they start getting a bit loose and they start falling off and it's a bit hot and it's a bit sticky. It's not pleasant wearing these things. And to stop expecting people to do it for you know, days and days and days on end, it becomes a limiting factor. So up to seven days is about the maximum that most people can tolerate of these sorts of uh, devices where there are um, multiple electrodes. Why do we use multiple electrodes? We get a better and more accurate trace. We get several leads of the ECG, not just one lead. Now, there's this little device, some people may have come across it, called a NovaCore. This is a slightly different device. This is an event recorder. So this is a, a small um, machine. You wear it as a pendant around your neck, and it has a single lead that goes off to, to here, B4. And what this does, it, it can essentially uh, monitor your heart for a week, provided it's attached, obviously. Take it off, it stops monitoring. It has a little button on it for symptoms. If you get a symptom, you can press the button. And what the machine is doing is it's constantly in its memory, keeping 30, uh, yeah, 40 se 45 seconds of recording. And if it thinks something's abnormal, like AF, it sort of notes that down in its little memory. And then it, it saves a few examples. So when you have a, a printout from this, it'll say, oh, there were, were you know, 150 ectopic beats. And it'll show you one example of them. And you can decide whether you think that's accurate or not. It also shows you when the patient pressed the button. So you can, the usefulness of this is to be able to say, I had a symptom of palpitations. What was my ECG doing at the time? Did I have an arrhythmia or not? The company who made this tell us that it can detect atrial fibrillation, and they've got a trial and various things. And it, I think it has some value to that. But the problem is, it doesn't really give you enough 
um, stored ECG strips to really sometimes be absolutely sure that it is atrial fibrillation and to pre start prescribing anticoagulant drugs where you haven't proven the diagnosis where those drugs may be dangerous to the patient potentially uh, and the benefit to them is uncertain, I find that difficult. So I think this isn't a great device for detection of atrial fibrillation, although some people do, do use it. You're limited to a, a week of recording with this, which is fine, but it's still a, a week. Now this is the latest thing that's coming. We're coming now into the, 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 um, the, the more modern things that are, are, are just about happening now. As we've moved through this talk, the pound sign for the investigation is getting bigger, okay? So the thousand pound patient is pretty cheap. The alive call we said was 160. I don't know how much a 24 hour whole term monitor costs. To buy them, they're very expensive, but you obviously can reuse them multiple times. But I think the CCGs are charged 150 pounds for doing that, and Nova Core will cost the similar amount of money. Um, and this device is very neat. So this is a little single-use patch, and you literally just stick it there. And you prep the skin, so it has to, if you're a male, it has to be shaved and beautifully prepared, because the quality of the recording is dependent on the preparation. And then you peel this thing off, it's got a backing, and you stick it down. And the idea is you can stick it there for two weeks you can wear this. It's very flat, uh, and we've had patients wearing these, and the feedback has been very, very good. When you've finished with it, you, they give you a little bag, you put it in the bag, send it, it goes for free post up to Coventry, the data is uploaded, <coughs> the electronics are taken out and recycled, and the patch and the rest of it is chucked away. And that data goes to America where they have this place where they analyze this, because this is going to record two weeks worth of full disclosure every single heartbeat. So 14 times 100,000, so it's got to be a lot of heartbeats, isn't it? It's one and a half million heartbeats. And then they email you the report back to the physician. Um, so we're just starting. I've got two patients I'm using this on this week, actually. And so I'll tell you another time how, what my personal experience is of it. But I think the idea is really neat. Um, and the ability to monitor for two weeks. And this means you can detect atrial fibrillation with a high degree of, of, of accuracy and certainty. And also, you, can, you could shower in this. You don't need to, to cover it. It's, it's sticky enough to shower. We've had athletes who can run using this. Somebody went swimming with it on. So it's remarkable, really, that you can, can do all this. And it's called a Zio. This is about 500 pounds up ago and it's not reusable so it's a cost implication it includes the analysis yeah everything so it's expensive um very expensive <laughs> this shows you what they picked up so this is a study and they've looked here at af detection and you can see as you would expect the more you look the more you find and you see as time goes on you pick up a few patients in the first day and then more and more and more and you keep picking them up as you go on so you could argue, by the time you get out to about here, you're not detecting very many more, but it will vary between the populations looked at. So I do think this is quite a neat, neat device, and uh, it, it shows you really what you kind of predict. The more you look for AF, the more you find it. So the CO is a, a new device, and it's I think it will will come into clinical use. The downside to the Zio is you've got to wear it for the two weeks. There is a button you can press on it, like if you get a symptom, so it logs that as well. But you've got to wear it for two weeks and then take it off and send it away. So a different approach has been for a company called Medtronic. So this is very similar to the Zio in what it looks like. It's a, a patch. It's wire-free, so it's easy to wear. <coughs> It's water resistant, you can do what you like with it, you don't have to change the battery, you don't have it in the CEO, and you can press the button to trigger it. But this is more clever, because this is now connecting to your mobile phone, and it's sending your data all the time, backwards and forwards, to Medtronic's monitoring center. So, what will happen with this is, I haven't used this, and I haven't met anyone in the UK yet who's used this, this is being used in America, 
is that within 20 minutes of the patient having an arrhythmia, the physician's got an email that says, your patient just had such and such. <laughs> Quite amazing. Yeah. So this is the idea. The wearable sensor, it's transmitting to a monitoring center, and then there's people reviewing the data and then sending you the report back, literally in real, almost in real time, which is quite clever. And they've got some data. All right, this is over $1,000, I think, to, to, to use. And, and Medtronic are putting this forward as a technique for assessment of arrhythmias when they're occurring infrequently. You can wear this for up to 30 days. So you can see we keep pushing the times out more and more. So I think this is quite a neat a neat device. Clearly this is not something for, for use in everybody, but let's say you had somebody where you were, who'd had a stroke and you were really concerned that they were having atrial fibrillation but you couldn't prove it. Well, a thousand dollars to prevent a stroke, if you found that it might be a very reasonable investment. So in certain situations you might see where this type of device could be useful. There's a couple of studies where they've actually done this and they've looked specifically in people who've come to hospital with a stroke and seen whether mon enhanced monitoring of them does allow you to detect atrial fibrillation. So this is called the EMBRACE trial. It was published uh, last year and it looked for 30 days. The, this, they're using a kind of belt thing. It doesn't look terribly comfortable, but there's a belt around the patient which is detecting the heart rhythm. And they monitored patients for a month post-stroke. These were all people who didn't have AF, but they were looking for AF. And in the study, the aim of the study was to try and determine, was 30 days of monitoring better than doing a 24-hour tape? Well, I think you can probably guess the answers to this uh, without even seeing the results. Um, there's a lot of fluff on this slide about who they were. They were older people that had a stroke. They didn't know known to have atrial fibrillation, and they looked at 564 people. And at the end, what they were measuring was, can we find AF, essentially? And you can see on this slide, if you can't read the numbers, 16% of the people who've had a stroke had, had, had got AF, if you looked at them with the, in the belt device, versus 3% who you looked with the 24-hour tape. So you only need to do it eight times to find a case of AF. And you're going to put those patients onto anticoagulation, recommend that to them. So it's very important, this, this huge public health thing. So this is a group where you really want to look carefully. I think that we should be looking more closely at people who've had a stroke, who don't have atrial fibrillation, obviously, to see if we can find it. Because if we're looking for it hard enough, probably we'll find it. And that just showed you the more monitoring you did, the more, but it's actually more impressive than that little graph we saw which suggested that two or three days was enough because you can see as you keep monitoring more and more and more you detect more and more. So you do need to monitor IREC for at least a couple of weeks to be able to be confident about uh, excluding any of your correlation. You might say that belt looked a bit uncomfortable. How many people actually could tolerate it? About 8 out of 10, 80%. So some people just couldn't tolerate the belt. So all of that is external stuff stuck onto the body, um, temporary, two weeks, one month. What about something implantable? You microchip the cat, don't you? And you microchip <laughs> the, the per human being. So there is something called a reveal device. If anyone's come across the reveal, it looked a bit like a USB stick that you put into your computer about that big. Uh, and you can implant it under the skin, make a little operation and, and, and put it in, and stitch it there. That was okay, and we used to use that quite a lot for people who'd had unexplained collapses and things. Then Medtronic developed this thing called the Link. I'll show you a little picture, video in a minute of it. And what the Link is, is it's tiny, it's the height of a AAA battery, and it's really almost wafer thin. And you can virtually inject it under the skin. And that will monitor for three years. And it comes again, a bit like that thing you saw before, with a, a transmitter that sits next to your bed, okay, with a 3G card in it. And every night when you go to bed, the machine communicates with the, 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 the box. It downloads the data off there, sends it off to the monitoring center, it's analyzed, and then the physician gets a report if something abnormal has happened. So if someone had an episode of AF in that three years, you would know about it. 
that's quite clever, really. And that technology is about well, three or four thousand pounds. Oh, so it's implantable, so it's expensive. So you can see a little video of how they put it in. Um, where are we? There you are. This is a bit, it's slightly promotional because it's made by Medtronic, but you get the idea. There's the little device, it's like a little chip. And it's just, I'm going to tell you where to put it, so it's just popped in here. Sort of on the angle of the heart, or there, you put it slightly to right angles. And he'll show you in a minute how to put it in. It could be put in, it's the moment they're put in the cath lab, but you could, you could put this in an outpatient setting, like a dermatology theatre or something, as long as it's a clean room clean air supply, you just prep the, the skin with antiseptic, it comes with this special device with it's got a blade on it, and you'll see what they do, it's as a model, but you pinch the skin, there you go, you sort of raise the skin up, you use this device to simply make a nick in the skin, the right size and depth, so we're going to do that now, little nick, and then take that out to see if it's a little, just a tiny tart, it's only through that bit. And then here's the applicator, it just gets pushed in, let's see in a second. There you go, pushed under the skin. Like that. Oh. Local anaesthetics given, so it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Give it a twist to make the space for the device to go in. You'll see that in a minute. And then in a minute, the device is going to go down this here. It's going to rotate it. It's quite a bit, a bit tedious, this. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's just to make this pocket for it. So it's got a little pocket to sit in. Here's the device coming. So you have the device is in the barrel of that thing. And then you simply push it in. There you go. It's going to inject it. They're trying to make it look like it's injectable. So it's almost like a outpatient procedure, and then as soon as you've done that, you can just pull the whole lot out. Okay, it's going to pull that out now. And then you put a steri strip over it. Do you think we'll be doing those in outpatients? Not in outpatients, but it may be in the theatre to see. It looks beautiful. Now that's the, that's the, um, that, that's the uh, promotional. You want to see what it actually looks like, really. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So this is somebody actually doing it in a real human being. You don't want to look, look away, but it's fine. You can see how quick it is. I mean, literally, this is two minutes. He's going to show you what to do. There you are. There's the nick coming on the skin. Yeah. There's the applicator going in. A little bit of pushing. And there's the device in the, in the thing. It's pushed in. You didn't do that twisting thing, obviously given up with that. Pulls it out, and there you go. That was less than 30 seconds, wasn't it? My cat's microchip is just click, yeah. and that's it. There you are, it's done. And that can stay for three years, that's very clever. I mean, it's, you, know, you can see how the, this world, the world is moving forward. Does it work? Is it a useful thing to have? They did this trial called Crystal where they used it. Um, you were randomised to either the device or standard treatment, which would be a tape, for, or, so I keep using that phrase tape, but a, a 24 hour monitor versus a three year monitor. I mean, we know what the data is going to show. They looked at the patients every month or so for a few months, and this is the rate. So at six months, with the implantable device, you've got about 12% of people who found AF in. Whereas with people who just put the tape on, you found it in about 1%. So you can see how much better it is. And if you look at <coughs> three years, then look at that. These are people who've had a stroke. Detection was 30% of people had AF. One in three versus 3% three in the control. So when you have a 24 hour tape after a stroke and they say, your tape's fine, you go, that's great doctor. You shouldn't be reassured, should you? Because it just shows you the more you look, the more you find. So maybe there's a case that everyone who has a stroke without an obvious cause should have a, a little device put in to monitor them. And as soon as you find the AF, onto anticoagulation. It's a thought.
if you if you have a stroke, shouldn't you be on anticoagulation anyway? Not, you have, no, you have, um, you're on aspirin or clopidogrel, but not on anticoagulants unless you've got AF. Yeah, no, you don't anticoagulate for stroke. You use clopidogrel. Um, so. I'm almost finished and you've got some time for questions. So we've been through all sorts of different things, from pu the simplest pulse check to the most invasive, not as that invasive, implantable loop recorder. And, you know, they'll all detect AF, but they'll only detect it when it's there. And therefore, if it is coming and going and intermittent, you need something that can detect for a long period of time. If it's there all the time, then a simple pulse check, the free pulse check is the best way. Um, confirmed by an ECG, but the intermittent is, the, is more of the, the thing. I think we'll see more and more use of these devices, these ex external ones, um, and who knows where, where the future lies really with all of this. So I'll stop at this point. I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. And take it from there.